Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 17, we're going to roll the 6v6. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. The 6V6 is a beam-powered tetrode. Now what in the heck does that mean? Well, tetrode is easy enough. The root is tetra or four. The beam-powered refers to an innovation in cathode design in which a pair of plates work together to focus the flow of electrons, increasing efficiency and powering up the tube. Let's take a quick look at a pinout sheet. Let's do the easy stuff first. Okay, so number one is normally vacant except on metal jacketed tubes where it would go to ground. Two and seven, that's your heater, and that's not part of your four. Starting at the top, number three is your is your plate. Number four is your screen grid. Number five is the control grid. That's where the signal goes on. And number eight, you can see, is this wraparound cathode. And we'll look at the unique plate structure and the underlying cathode um, when we take a quick look at the tubes. Now, the 6V6 was first introduced by Ken Rad, Tube and Lamp Corp, in 1936. It was designed as a scaled-down version of the 6L6, for use specifically in car and tabletop radios, though it wasn't long before it started being used in guitar amplifiers. It can produce 5 watts of continuous power in Class A and 14 watts in Push-Pull, or Class B. Guitar amplifier builders soon started pushing the specified limits and claimed 40 watts of peak power from a pair of 6V6 GTAs. Given the very long history of the 6V6, it's not surprising that a number of variants came along over the years, including the 6V6, a metal jacketed version, the GTA, with a controlled warm-up period, 5871 and 5992, which are ruggedized versions for aircraft and similar applications, and the latest version is the 6V6S, made by JJ Electronics, with a large plate plus higher plate and screen voltages. I don't have a JJ to test, unfortunately, but if somebody sends me a matched pair, I'd be happy to. Okay, enough with the history. How do they sound? Up first is the Electroharmonics 6V6 GT. New stock. And of course it's got the Electroharmonics gorgeous label here. These actually go back all the way to 09. And they've got a really nice support rod. Let me get it on camera for you. Let's see if you can see it. You've got a pair of them, one on each. There's one coming up here. There it is. And there's another one on the other side. Let's put the line up. Now to start off, one of these tubes fizzled right away. It was the first tube up in my listening tests, and it just pissed me off. And put a damper on the whole listening session. Now does that mean that these are bad tubes? No, it happens, folks. These are fragile. They, they'll die for no particular reason. And I can remember as a boy um, helping my grandfather and my father repair the TV and the stereo console. And the method, the home method of repairing to save money was you'd get a cardboard box, usually a shoe box, and you'd stick every you'd pull every tube in the console or TV out and you might make a little sketch as to where the heck they all went number it and you go down to the drugstore 
and I, I'm not kidding you, we went to the local drugstore, and this is very common, and up front they'd have a tube tester with racks and racks of brand new in the box tubes. And you just keep plugging them in until you found the bad one. And with any luck, you'd plug everything back in and hit the switch and you'd have some music or your TV would start working again. Okay. So, does that, does that mean that these are bad? No, Electroharmonix makes good quality middle of the road tubes for most common types. In fact, their EL34 is one of my favorite tubes. So how did they sound? Bass was good, with nice tone and detail. Same goes for the mid-range and treble. The one thing I didn't like is that they sounded slightly dark. Now if I had a guitar amplifier that was overly bright, or I liked that dark tone, this may be your tube. Next is the RCA 6V6 GTA. Let's have a quick look at it. These are new old stock and always take a look. The print is perfect, but always take a look at the base. If the base looks, look at that. It's sparking. It's just sparkling. It's so brand new. The base looks good and it tests strong. This, this is testing at 113% then you know you've got a, a good new old stock. But how did they sound? Bass was good. Mid-range was very nice with lots of detail, and yet maintained that smooth mid-range many like. Treble was good with some sparkle. Overall, a nice vintage tube. Next is a vintage 1960s reflector. 6P 6S in English, or in Cyrillic, Russian, 6N, 6C, and that's what the Russians will always print on their tube. But today, and for a while now, the Russians have been, even when they're advertising tubes for sale, they'll strictly use the English version when they're writing in English. Now this dates from the first week of 1966, and many Russian tubes from the 1960s back into the 1950s are really wonderful tubes. They made good tubes all the way up until the end of the Soviet Union in that era 1987 to 1990. There's probably well-made tubes in that period. I have some. In fact, I have quite a few. Uh, but it is a period that has that big question mark. You know, did they have exactly the right material? Were people paying more attention to their next meal? rather than making the tubes the way they were supposed to be built. Anyways, we also have the exact same tube. Look at this. Made in Germany. Micron. This Reflector 6V6 is probably the most commonly rebranded 6V6. And there we've got one that says Sobtek. What the heck's that? Made in Russia. Is that another manufacturer? No, Sovtech is the Western brand name that Reflector used. Look at that, there you go. 1960 and there's the Reflector logo. So you know that this was made for export for certain. And I'm in the West, so that makes sense. Though I do import a lot of Russian tubes directly from, um, from Russia and the various former East Bloc countries. Okay, how did they sound? Bass was good plus, with nice tone. Mid-range was very nice, detailed with just the right amount of richness, and treble was very nice as well, detailed with lots of sparkle. In summary, this tube had detail and punch as well as a good sound stage. I found myself tapping my foot, something that doesn't happen every day. Given how inexpensive these tubes are and how much fun, I'm going to award these a best buy. Next is the GE6V6 GTA. And they're a rebranded tool. It says right on here, made for Macintosh. And the, the print is just beautiful on these tubes. And then it says, by General Electric USA. Now, Macintosh is a really quality equipment manufacturer in the U.S., They've been around forever. 
And I think they actually, this is unusual to rebrand and then name the manufacturer. I almost never see that. I think they're actually proud that General Electric in the U.S. made these tubes rather than a cheap rebrand from China or uh, a much less expensive tube from Russia, for example. And again, we can look at the pins and they're just perfect. And here you can see really clearly, oh, here you can see the General Electric used acid etching, as many European manufacturers did for their manufacturing code, and it stayed pretty good. And you can probably just barely see on camera a couple of little dots. That's a manufacturing code of some sort. And that tells you that that's a GT, GE as well. But if we didn't have that, we didn't have the nice descriptor from Macintosh, look at this. These tubes are totally complete. They've got a manufacturing date code and a manufacturer's code. So 6530 means the 30th week of 1965. And 188-4 that's the, one of the GE manufacturing codes. They had a couple of them. Okay, but how did that, these beautiful looking tubes sound? Bass was very nice with punch. Mid-range was good, detailed and rich. Treble was good, clean, clear and crisp. Or like I like to note, the three C's. Overall, a nice vintage tube. Next is the C. Vania 6v6 GT. Let's take a quick look at it. Now, a lot of Sylvania tubes that are smoked use this medium gray charcoal. And if you're having trouble identifying, if you're missing the label and you're having trouble, that's a hint that it's a Sylvania. So it's got a chrome dome, which means that we've got a top getter, which is not that common in a 6v6 but we have a nicely labeled tube, so we know it's a Sylvania. But how did the Sylvania sound? Bass was good, with nice tone. Mid-range was good plus, open and clean, with just enough warmth. And treble was very nice, clean, clear, and crisp. Overall, a nice tube with very good detail. Next is the RCA 6V6 Metal Can. Now caution, pin one grounds the case. Most 6v6 sockets should have pin one vacant, but check before plugging one in. Let's take a quick look so that you know. Now when you're looking for where pin one is, it's not this way. It's always from the point of view of the builder of the amp, which is upside down. That's how we build amps. So find the keyway on an octal. Get it up close so you can just see it there. And right over here on this side is pin 1, pin 2, and of course right here that's pin 8. So, but how did they sound? Bass was good. Mid-range was clear with a bit of punch, and treble was good plus. Good detail and just enough warmth and sparkle. Overall a nice tube. Very similar to the 6L6 metal can I reviewed in a previous tube lab. What makes these tubes stand out is the level of clarity. I think this is because the metal can dampens all microphonics, making for a very low distortion tube. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Given how little new old stock, new in the box metal tubes sell for, this could be a bargain. Now watch out, the metal casing can get very, very, very hot. Fry an egg hot. Don't ask me how I know that. Oh, and here we've got another, another one. New old stock, new in the box. So NOS, NIB. Branded Sylvania. But... Turn it over, and there we go. We've got an orange stop sign. That's not always going to tell us that that's an RCA. It's a good indicator, though. But if you were to compare the tubes, you'd see there's a little crease at the top. The 6L6 has the same crease at the top. Virtually identical. Now, I happen to know Sylvania never made a metal. I don't think they made any metal tubes. 
So they would have bought in bulk from RCA and rebranded, so they'd have some available to sell to their customers. Okay, last but not least is my number 119 branded Zenith 6V6G made in Canada. Let's have a look at it. Here's your Zenith label. Replace only with genuine blah 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 Zenith parts. There's your your hint maybe as to what this tube, who made this tube. There's your medium gray smoked coating with a bottom getter which means we've got a what I call a waist chrome and a clear dome of course with a shield see if you can see that shield on the very top of the heater and that'll glow quite nicely and testing at 110 percent I actually have a matched pair of these within a one percent and in 70 year old tubes or even 80 year old tubes possibly that's getting rarer and rarer and very hard to find and of course with Single-ended output stages, um, a match pair is a, really a, a requirement. If you're like me, I refuse to put volume controls on my on my mono blocks. Okay, but how do how do they sound? Bass was very nice, nice tone and a wee bit of punch. Mid-range was very nice, clean and open, detailed, not overly smooth. Just nice and natural. Treble is very nice, clean, clear, and crisp, with just enough sparkle. This tube had detail, 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 according to my notes, with punch and dynamics. Can you tell I really like these tubes? Now, who made this, though? Zenith didn't make small tubes. They did make cathode tubes um, for TVs, cathode ray tubes, big boys, big suckers. Um, so we know this is a rebrand, and it took me a long time researching this, but eventually I came to the conclusion that with that solid waste chrome, the charcoal gray here, that in fact, this is a Sylvania, which is great because Sylvania makes wonderful tubes. Let's take a quick look at what came in this week. A lot of stuff has been coming in lately. Now many of you know that my hobby, not my business, my hobby is, is designing and building tube amps. And I've been working on a prototype phono preamp and a couple more line stage preamps. And I've been running out of space. So this is my typical IEC inlet. It has an integrated fuse holder. Many of you probably use these. They're very easy to install. They're solid. I've never had a problem with them. And it's nice to have the fuse in. This is the old style. No fuse, no switch. And they work fine if you want to have a separate fuse holder and a separate switch. And of course they cost next to nothing. But I needed a little bit more space. I normally put my on-off switch on the top of the plate of my chassis. And I just didn't have enough room because I'm running dual power supplies. And I found this. I've been looking at these for a couple of years and wondering if they'd be any good. And they're beautifully made. They have the integrated fuse holder like what I normally use and an integrated switch. And the neat thing, let's see if I can pop that out for you. These holders look they look like they might be kind of cheap and not hold those fuses well, but actually they're really well made. And they insert, you load the fuse in here, and you insert it with a nice click, and they stay put. I've never had a problem. But let's flip it over. So this is the same as what I've been using all along. This lower part here is identical. What's different is that the switch has actually got four poles on it so it can switch both the neutral and the hot side together whereas up until now I've been only switching the hot side which is pretty common and I think it's just fine but this is definitely a preferred method to switch both your neutral and your hot so you basically disconnect everything except for the, the house ground that comes in on the green wire which is great anyways they're not expensive and I'll have them in the store today I love them uh, what else came in 
just make a little bit more room here. Oh, a whole bunch of gorgeous E80 CCs, Tungs Rams, mule stock. Just take a look at the pins. They're just perfect. Now, one of the problems with these tubes, you've probably seen me talking about these as a close substitute for a 12AU7 or a maybe substitute. Watch watch the uh, tube lab on the subject. I won't go into details, but one of the problems with the Tungs Ram, not the Phillips version, but the Tungs Ram is that quite a few of these, about 10%, are noisy at idle. They'll actually have a fair amount of hiss that's noticeable and makes the tube, the tube will work fine in circuit, but that amount of hiss when you have a quiet package pa passage is totally unacceptable. So of course, I typically, if I buy 10 new old stock tubes, the seller is refunding me for one of them at least. Anyways, quite a few of those came in. They're all testing beautiful new old stock. One of my favorite tubes. In fact, um, I'm going to uh, work on a prototype uh, preamp that's not a just a 12AU7 circuit. Uh, I'm going to make a dedicated circuit specifically for the E80CC. And we'll see if we can bring up the performance even a notch better. A bunch of 6v6 new old stocks came in. And here's one of these orange labeled RCAs. And look at, they're just perfect. Really lovely tubes. God knows where all these unused tubes that are now 50 and 60 years old show up from. But my wholesalers find them. And after a lot of haggling, we do a deal on a bulk lot. These came in. And these. this is one of my favorite EL34s. This is an original Flying C. Now, these ceased production, I believe, in 2002. New Sensor, which is an American corporation and owns one of the big Russian tube factories. They make electroharmonics as one of their main lines of tubes. They actually have... In the U.S., they own the rights to the Svetlana. This is a Svetlana brand name. It's a big stylized S. Now, C is Cyrillic for R-S, right? So, Savannah. Um, and um, the distinguishing features, if you're looking, if you're comparing this to, I don't have one of the new um, Svetlanas, is the base. These bases always look like they've been around, they've gone to war and come back. They've got this really antique looking dark maroon brown. They tend to have these little marks on them. I'm not sure if they mark up easily or what. And they have this segmented base around the bottom. And of course you've got to match up the plate structure and these little holders that they put in to keep the tube nice and snug. And one of the real giveaways that this is the real McCoy is the dimple top. You'll see them advertised like that. And I actually found quite a few of these. We'll get them in the store eventually. They all test new old stock, even though they're used. And um, we'll have some match quads for sure. Okay. Well, that was fun. If you stay to the end, here's some discount codes. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Stay safe, everyone. Cheers.